Well, if you would take out your notes, we're going to talk about the power of worship. Uh, but before we do, I'd like to tell you a fun story. There's a story of uh, one of our church saints passed away and went to heaven. And when he got to heaven, St. Peter greeted him. And this, this place uh, was amazing. I mean, gates and mansions. But Peter said, here, let me show you around. There was a, someone from New Hope West here. So, so the, the, Peter said, you know, you're privileged. You're wonderful people. I heard your worship. You're amazing. So come, I'm going to show you around heaven. Well, as he showed this person around heaven, there were clocks everywhere. Clocks on the walls, clocks on trees, clock, and some were moving quickly, some were moving very slowly. And he said, what's the deal with all these clocks, St. Peter? And St. Peter said, well, these are sin clocks. What? Yeah, we have a clock for every person in your church. And he said, you're kidding. I said, yeah, there's, these are sin clocks. And we have actually one for every person in the world of all time. Whoa, he says, just like a warehouse of clocks. He said, yeah. He said, here, Billy Graham's clock. And Billy Graham's clock was not like moving at all. And they said, here's Mother Teresa's. Hers has been still for years and years. Wow. And so some were moving quickly, some were moving more slowly. So this person kept looking around. He said, could I ask you a question? He said, yeah. He said, where's Pastor Wayne's clock? And St. Peter said, ah, oh, he's very well known up here. And the person said, really? Yeah, we keep his clock up in the front office. We use it as a fan. <laughs> well, there's not really clocks in heaven. There's not sin clocks. But there is something very, very special that I want you to be aware of. Something else. And that's worship. Worship is in heaven. Revelation chapter 4, and in different places in the book of Revelation, it talks about angels worshiping God 24-7. It's like they have shifts, and they just keep worshiping, and they actually put out the words, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and is to come, and they're just singing worship all day long, all night long. And it says, and there is the presence of God, and I thought, wow. If worship is that important and God actually it, it finds his throne in the midst of angelic worship, I thought, oh my. But I thought, you know, God, you make your throne or your presence known in an atmosphere of worship and praise. Mm -hmm. Ah, so the angels knew something. But you see, God doesn't only allow angels to develop an atmosphere where his presence comes. He allows people to do the same and it's right at the top of your notes so if you'll take a look at your notes right at the top of it would you read it nice and loudly as if you were a Shakespearean actor ready go you are enthroned on the praises of your yeah not only angels but God gives us the privilege to establish an atmosphere of praise that invites his presence I thought that is amazing you see, we want to talk about the power of worship. If we don't understand the divine power of worship that even threatens hell itself, if we don't understand it, then we're just going to come together and sing religious songs or watch other people, listen to other people sing religious songs. And then we wonder why God still seems so far away. If angels understand the power, the divine power, the extraordinary power of worship, in the heavenlies, then as we continue building the foundations of this church, we need to work that in as one of the main ingredients in the very foundation building blocks, the power of worship. Some people, sometimes I know, we come after worship is done. I just want to listen to the sermon. No, you don't understand the power of worship. It's establishing an atmosphere in which the presence of God comes. And we need everybody there with all of their hearts to welcome the presence of the king. Otherwise... He won't be there. He'll be absent. Someone once said it this way. They said, you know, half, you can take half of the churches out of America and uh, th no one will ever notice that they're gone. Why? Because the Holy Spirit isn't empowering them. They're singing religious songs. So, ah, so we've got to make sure that we understand worship. Yeah. So as we build the foundations of the church, we want to make sure worship is a critical part 
And in fact, did you know that when God was building the foundations of creation, he decided to have his background music worship. He actually created the worlds against the backdrop of worship and praise. The story is about he and Job. Now, Job had gotten very, very sick. Satan had inflicted him so much. And one day, Job was questioning God. Sort of like, not in just like, oh, why is this happening? He is almost questioning God in a, in a challenging way. Like, uh, if you're so powerful, couldn't you oversee my life a little better than it's being spent right now? I am just deathly sick. And he kept querying and questioning God like that in a challenging way. And it's like God kind of headed up to here with Job. And he, he says this to Job. And would you read it with me? It'll come up on the board. And let's read it together. Go. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And who set its measurements? Who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? In other words, how is it suspended in space? Where is all of the pillars, the supports for this? It's invisible, isn't it? He continues, and who laid its cornerstone? Watch this. What was happening when the... And all the sons of God... Yeah, did you see that? When God was creating the universe and putting stars in place and planets, spinning them, and everything moving in galaxies and solar systems. He said, come on, let's, let's worship a little bit more, please. Yes, I got a lot of work to do. Let's continue. Thank you very much. And he's actually creating the worlds against a backdrop of worship. I thought, wow, you had background music of worship while you were creating? Uh-huh. And I thought, you know, God, I looked at that and I thought, if we want you to do more creating in us, Maybe we should worship more. Instead of complaining or challenging God, if you love me, if you were so all-powerful, all couldn't you oversee my life a little better? Maybe we should, instead of doing that, maybe we should just get out in the forest and worship him for an hour. And maybe then and there he'll begin to do the creating that we would like him to do. You see, there is a, a, an amazing power in worship that if we don't understand, then we lose. We miss out. I'm going to tell you four things about, the, uh, about praise and about worship. And one of the reasons, by the way, that when we come together at New Hope West, we, we start with praise and thanksgiving. Because the scripture says, enter his gates with praise, enter his courts with thanksgiving. So when we come into this place, we actually are doing a scriptural invitation. We are fulfilling that with praise and thanksgiving. Even our giving is out of thanksgiving for all that you've done, Lord. I just want to in some way say thank you in, in a material, visible, expressible way. It's not just in my thoughts, Lord. I really want to be a part of what you're doing in the world. And so I take some of what you've already given me and I say, Lord, would you use this and multiply it? Because in my hands, I can't multiply it. But in yours, you can. 30, 60, 100, 1,000, a million fold. So, Lord, I put that in your hands so that you can use my little offering or my little contribution in a huge way. It's all out of thanksgiving. So even our giving is a part of our thanksgiving and praise. That's why you'll hear some people say, let's continue our worship as we give. They're actually right. But we may not understand that. We think it's just a neat platitude that they say in church. No, it really is. Because we enter his gates with praise and enter his courts with thanksgiving. So when we come, one of the very first things we do is establish an atmosphere for God's presence to come and be a part of us. Then his miracles begin. So never think that just singing or listening to religious songs is going to do it. Enter into his courts with praise. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving. And it includes us. One of the most amazing things about the Israelites when they went through the desert uh, in the Sinai after having left Egypt as slaves, they came through and you can almost trace their pathway by the altars that they were making. 
Because whenever God would do something great, like open the Red Sea, they would get through, Pharaoh's army is devastated. They'd stop, Moses wrote a song, and they would build an altar and worship God. They go a little further, God gives them manna. They build an altar and worship God. God gives them water. They build an altar and worship God. They're always building altars. So if you would go around the, in that time in the desert, you can almost trace the pathway of the Israelites. They were identified as the people of God. Why? Because they're worshiping at all of these points here. They just pause and build an altar. And they usually build it with 12 stones. Do you remember why 12 stones? One for each tribe of Israel. This is Jacob. Or rather, this is a, a jo, uh, uh, Ephraim. This is Manasseh. This is Reuben. This is Gad. All of these stones represented one of the tribes of Israel. And then they would worship, do a sacrifice, move on. So if someone wanted to know where the Israelites were going, they would just trace these altars. You see, worship identifies us as the people of God. One of the reasons we left England is because we wanted to be identified as a people of God to have freedom of worship. Now, we live in a society where that is being challenged. So all the more, we must redouble our efforts to say, no, we are a people of God. I am sorry. And I'm not going to let you steal my identity. Have you ever had anyone steal your credit card or your identity and use it? How many of you have had your credit card taken, stolen, used by somebody else? It is not a fun thing. And it's almost like, you're stealing my identity. You're faking it. I've had 42 imposters so far on Facebook. And they, they call themselves by my name, and they try to raise money for this orphanage somewhere. And uh, I got, can I, you have time for a story? This is really funny. <laughs> ah, there's a couple that wrote to me from Japan and uh, they said we saw you on Facebook and we gave a thousand dollars to your orphanage and I said oh no that's another imposter I said I'm so sorry please watch out for that they're they're faking my identity and they said no no we need to tell you a story that happened a few months ago and we gave that thousand dollars because my wife and I agreed and but then after that we split up and uh, problems took place. And then we were looking at our finances and we remembered that we gave that money. And even if it wasn't to you, for some reason, God used that decision that we both made to do something for ministry that we thought God has called us together for a reason. And she said, and so our marriage came back together. So even if it was a fake, it's okay because God used it for his glory. Isn't that great? I thought, wow. But having your identity stolen is just terrible. And what was happening was the people of Israel stopped making altars of worship. All the way from Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy, all the way into Leviticus, Numbers, all those first five books of the Bible, they were building altars. And then they stopped. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. 1st and 2nd Samuel, now in the 1st and 2nd Kings, they had stopped being a people identified as worship. Their identity was stolen. They had blended in with the prophets or the people of Baal, which was a fertility god, very immoral, and Ashereth, which, which was another immoral uh, god. And you can see the same thing happening in our world today. It's causing the people of God to blend in to one side or another. And by the way, the devil always tries to make it a binary war where it's between two groups, Republicans or Democrats or blacks or whites or, or um, you know, someone that's straight or someone that's not straight. And it's just a binary war and it gets people split again and again and again and until he's fractured us completely. Well, in that day, it was the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. <laughs> They had gotten together on a place called Mount Carmel and, and the people of Israel had just blended in. So it was like, we, we're with this group and we're with this group. Well, Elijah comes on the scene and God says to Elijah, you need to bring the people back together. They have stopped worshiping me. They're worshiping other gods. They're following other things. They no longer build altars to me. They have lost their identity. So Elijah 
and he's called a hairy man. You know, he's got, I guess he's just Neanderthal. But he, he, he comes up and he challenges the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asheroth. He says, I want to meet you. We're going to have a showdown at the OK Corral. And you bring your followers with you. So there are 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asheroth come together. And they're going to go against one guy. Now, they don't know what he wants to do, whether he wants to box them or what, but they're just going to have a showdown. So all the people that follow from Israel, the ones that are the Asheroth followers and the Baal followers, all gather together. So they're mixed up. There's just a, a multifaceted collection of these people. There's no people of God. It's just blended into the society. And Elijah looks at them, and he says something very strong. He says, where are the people of God? Have you lost your identity? And this is what he says. Would you read it? It'll come up on the board. Read it nice and loudly. Go. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. He said, how long are you going to hesitate between the two? If you think Baal is God, follow him. But if God is God, with all your heart, follow him. So the people didn't know what to do. And he looked at the altar that was there. And he must have met on Mount Carmel because they actually had an altar of worship there. And the Bible says the altar was in disrepair and disarray because they hadn't done anything. They, had, they stopped worshiping. So the stones had fallen down. And the next verse says this, so Elijah began to repair the altar that was broken down. And to me, it's almost like God is saying, I want to repair the altar of worship that is broken down in our church because they don't understand the power, the divine power of worship. It's not just singing. There is an eternal ramification that takes place when the people worship. So, and you can read here in verse 31, it says, So Elijah took how many stones? According to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. So the stones were about as big as this speaker here. And so they're, they're big. And it says he began to repair it. But every stone may have had the name of one of the tribes of Israel. So if you're from the tribe of Asher, you're from the tribe of Gad, or you're from the tribe of Ephraim or Manasseh or Reuben. This would be sort of your stone. And so Elijah repaired the altar. He would pick up a stone like this. And it's just like Jones or Smith or whatever it might be. And so he'd pick up these stones. And your name may be, as it were, written on one of these. Because you belong to one of these tribes. That's who we are. And he'd take one of these and, and he'd drop it down. Kaboom. And he'd look up and say... Asher! And if you were from the tribe of Asher, your heart would start to beat like crazy in your chest. He'd pick but another one. Bang! Reuben! Reuben! And if you're from the tribe of Reuben, your identity starts coming back to you. That's who I am. That's who I am. Bang! Gad! Bang! Benjamin! Bang! Manasseh! And he went through all 12 and all of a sudden, the people's hearts began to beat again. And he repaired the altar. He was about to do a sacrifice on it. You see, the people of the prophets of Baal and Asherah were, were asked to do a sacrifice and call on their God. And their God didn't answer because their God was a non-entity. He called on the name of the Lord, and God answered with fire. And the people whose identity had been restored because of this altar had been repaired, they began crying out, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And see, what happened is in the midst of rebuilding worship, their identity was restored. And when you and I begin to worship God, it's like, this is who I am. This is who God created me to be. I come under his mantle. I come under his protection. I honor God, not anything else. I must obey God rather than men. And all of a sudden, we know who we are again. One of the very most prominent things that worship does when we worship is it restores your identity. And you start to remember again 
who you are and who he created you to be. And right now in America, we need to rebuild the altars of worship. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Yeah. But let me give you a couple of postures that uh, you see us do. And one, you see people lifting their hands. And I want to encourage you to do that. And you say, well, why do we lift our hands in worship? Well, because one, it's a sign of victory. It's also a sign of surrender. But first, let me talk about victory. If you're running in a race and... Uh, you're ahead of everybody else. It's a 100-meter race and, or 200-meter, and you're, you're running, and you're starting. You watch these Olympians, and when one pulls ahead of the rest, and he breaks that tape with his chest, what's the first thing that goes up in the air? His hands. Bang! And he breaks that. It's like a sign of victory. And when I lift my hands, it's like, Lord, it doesn't matter what the scoreboard says. We win. We win. We're coming across the line with your power. And so when you lift your hand, it isn't just to air out your armpits. It's because we are a people of victory. Can you say amen to that? We are a people of victory. In fact, the scripture says it this way. The scripture says, he who has lifted my head above mine enemies. Lift your head, all ye gates. What, what is he saying? Start to express your victory. Otherwise, we'll walk around like victims defeated losers. He says, no, no, no. Especially when you come into my presence, you remember who you are. You're victorious in Christ Jesus, bought by the blood of Christ. So we get to be a people who lift our hands because there's victory. Let's read the scripture here in Exodus 17 and 11. If you remember me speaking about Moses who was up on the hill. Joshua was fighting in the valley with the Amalekites. Do you remember when Moses lifted up his hands? They what? They prevailed. And when he brought his hands down, they started to be defeated. In the same way, we need to lift our hands in this church and say, Lord, we're going to start prevailing. There's people that are fighting battles all around you. Every single person here is fighting a very difficult battle when they come to this church. And as we begin to proclaim victory over them, then there's going to be miracles that take place. That's why we want people to come to church, not just to come to a program, come to an atmosphere where the presence of God is being invited and people are establishing that in the midst of their worship. We're identifying who we are. And all of a sudden, that one who is hurting begins to understand, no, she's a victor, not a victim. And I can overcome this. I will outlast it by the power of God in me. And when they leave, they leave differently from when they arrive. Something divine had taken place because we understood the power of worship. Let's read about it. Would you read the scripture with me? Go. So it came about that when Moses held his Israel prevailed. And when he let his hands down, Amalek prevailed. You know, the reason why God wanted the Amalekites destroyed was because of their insidious tactics as the people of Israel left Egypt. They would wait in the rear of the line of Israelites and they would pick off those that were sick and elderly and couldn't keep up. And they would just start, just like snipers, just picking them off one by one. And they would kill all of those that lagged behind that were sick or that were suffering of anything. And God got so incensed. He says, you, you Moses and Joshua, will take care of the Amalekites until their tribe is no more because of what they did to Israel. And I thought about that. And I thought, you know, Lord, there's people coming to our church that's going to have those same struggles. They'll be lagging behind. They'll be hurting. They'll be fighting battles. And we need to lift our hands on the mountain. Can you say amen to that? We need to lift our hands in the midst of worship and proclaim victory because there's a bunch of people around us that need you to be a people of worship because therein lies the power of God. So one, it's for victory. But it's also a sign of surrender. We can be like Job and challenge God a little too much. And the opposite of that is worship. What is the antidote to our hearts being lifted up against God is really worship. And that humbles ourselves, ourselves again and it brings us to a point of surrender. I surrender. If you're, if you're working at 7-Eleven at 2 o'clock in the morning 
and someone puts a 357 Magnum in your back, what's the first thing that'll go up? Yeah, before that, it'd be the hairs on the back of your neck, wouldn't it? And then you'll just shoot your hands up, right? It's a sign of surrender. It's like, take whatever you want. You can get all the Slurpees you want. Go right ahead. And when we're in the presence of God, we want to say, Lord, whatever your agenda is, not mine, you run that right through me. I surrender. I've been fighting you, or I've been trying to outsmart you, whatever, you fill in the blank. But there's a beautiful victory that takes place when you surrender to God. And when you surrender to God, it'll probably be your greatest victory that you've ever won. At that moment, you cross the finish line. And so what a beautiful thing it is. And that's why the scripture says this. And would you read the next one? How he actually talks to us. Let's read it together what Paul says to Timothy. Go. Therefore, I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without or... Yeah, there's times I need to say, Lord, I've gotten mad this week. I'm mad at so-and-so. Would you take that from me? And it behooves you to lift your hands. And allow God to begin to extract that spirit or that, that oppressive of emotion out of you. Because otherwise you fall victim to it, don't you? Yeah. I do. It's like, I can't stand this. Well, I need to deliver you from that, don't I? Yeah, Lord. Then worship. And when you do, something of that victimhood that, that causes you to capitulate to that anger or, or to that resentment or whatever it is, it's taken away. Now you can overcome it. Because it doesn't hold you hostage anymore. There's a power to worship. It's not just singing religious songs. It may be one of the most important things we do here at our church. It's a sign of victory and a sign of surrender. But it's also a sign of blessing for protection. Blessing. Uh, read what Jesus uh, does in Luke 24 and verse 50. Nice and loudly go. He led them as far as... And he lifted up his hands and he lifted up his hands and he lifted up his hands and yeah, when you lift up your, you know, sometimes I think, you know, the reason we're not blessed more because we don't bless enough. Yeah, one of the reasons why God may not bless us enough is because we don't bless one another. We need to be a part of blessing one another. And the Lord lifted up his hands and yeah, there's times in church we just need to lift up our hands and say, Lord, we lift up our hands. Would you bless this church? Would you bless the people that are hurting, that find their way in here and muster up all the courage they can muster up just to come through those doors? And God, may they, when they come here, may they find your blessing. Well, who releases that? It's an atmosphere of worship because then he makes his throne, his presence known on the praises of his people. Another thing is for protection. Sometimes I will be praying and I will actually turn to the city and ask God not only to bless the city but to protect the people that are Christians and people that are suffering from all the stuff that's going on. Actually, it's a, it's a sign of covering. Let's read what the scripture says. Would you read it nice and loudly with me? It's out of Lamentations. Go. At the beginning of the night watches... Before the presence of the Lord, lift up your hands to him for the life of your... Yeah, there's times, I remember when my kids were still young, I would go into their room and just lift up my hands over them and say, Lord, would you protect my children, protect my daughters, protect my son. Lord, I pray because the enemy would love to mess their lives up. So I speak the name of Jesus over them right now that the gates of hell will not prevail. You understand? There's spiritual warfare going on. This is not just a posture of praise. It's actually a spiritual battle that you're winning in prayer. And you'll see the results of it along the way. But you need to ask God to protect. My son Aaron, I, I don't know how much um, benefit uh, I did to him, but... Uh, <laughs> But you, you pray protection. And if you would do that, maybe our children would not be faced with so much temptation and fall so readily to it because there is the Moses on the hill over Joshua's of our life. And we're asking God for protection. So let's be a people who when you lift your hand, there's a purpose to it. It's not just like a Pentecostal posture. No, 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 no. There is a spiritual power 
to that. And then finally, one of the things you'll hear around here, we clap a lot. After we pray, we clap. Why? Because in the Hebrew tradition, it was actually the sealing of a contract. I sell this to you for so much, and you say, okay, and you pay that, and they would clap. And when we're done praying, it's a part of us saying amen. I agree with that. I seal that contract. When a song is sung, a chorus is done, we clap. Not because, yeah, you did a good job. No. It's because we agree and seal that in the name of Jesus. It's your breath in our lungs. And Lord, it's without you, we can do nothing. So we sing praise in Jesus' name, amen. These bones will cry out, amen. And so God, you're going to give life, amen. So when you clap after a chorus, all you're doing is sealing that contract. And I think it's healthy for us to do so. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, amen. Clapping is so important because it's just simply saying, amen, I seal that contract. Now, we clap at sports events. We clap at a, for a team that we want to identify with. Why not Jesus? I remember once I went to a Colorado Rockies game. I don't know if you know them, but I was in Denver for a conference, and we went to Coors Stadium, and there we were with the Colorado Rockies. A friend of mine was a fan. I'm not. I, I was actually going for the Texas Rangers that they were playing against, and so I was wearing red, white, and blue, and it was like a sea of purple, because that's the Colorado Rockies color, and I was sitting there in a sea of purple with red, white, and blue. That's not a safe thing to do. And they would go, yeah, when someone would hit a good you know, hit, and I would clap. And then when one of the Texas Rangers hit a base hit or a double or a triple, I'd go, yeah, uh, uh, okay. You know? And everyone's like looking, who in the world are you? And it was so uncomfortable. I had to really, after a bit, move away from them because they were daggers shooting at me. And I thought, oh, you know, when you clap, you're basically expressing whose team you're on. Isn't that right? Whose team you're supporting. And when I applaud in church, I'm saying, I'm on Jesus' team. And I want to express that in Jesus' name. And hell takes note of that and says, okay, just one to check. Just wanted to check if you would blend in with us or not. Just wanted to check. So clapping is, a, is to sign a contract, but, uh, to seal a contract. But I want you to read the scripture with me. It's going to come up here. And... Uh, now, this is going to be a foreign kind of scripture unless you understand. When the king went out to battle, they would take the flag down. So when people at a distance would look and there was no flag flying, they knew that the king wasn't there. He was not present. The king was not in the castle, in the house. His presence was gone. But when the king would come back from a battle... He would often bring, uh, lead his entourage of warriors. Behind his warriors would be, indeed if he were victorious, would be the defeated people following behind who would become workers or slaves or whatever. And when they heard that the king is coming back, they would take their uh, petals like flowers that had fragrance in them and they would line the cobblestone streets maybe with an inch or so of petals, of flowers. This was just their way of doing it to welcome the king back. And when the king would enter the gates, the flag would go up because he is victorious and he would march in on his steed or with the chariots or whatever they had and the soldiers would march. As they came through the cobble streets, they would crush the flower petals and there would be a fragrance. People would line the streets and what? Clap. Because why? Because clapping was a sign of victory. And they would applaud the king as he entered the castle. And the cobblestone streets lined with flower petals that were fragrant would emit a beautiful fragrance. And that fragrance would remind the people as they clap of the victory that was won. Now, Interestingly, behind the king would be those taken in warfare. But before we get there, let's read this together, nice and loudly. Would you go? But thanks be to God, who always leads us in the 
triumph of Christ and manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are... Mm, really interesting because you see that same fragrance that, a, that reminded them of victory. And by the way, the Lord says, when you worship me, that fragrance of the saved is a fragrance unto God. And it pleases him. But when the opponents that were taken in battle, they were now defeated, they would come with chains or ropes and they would be walking the same street and that same fragrance that, uh, that meant victory, that indicated victory to one, that same fragrance actually meant and defined defeat to another. And I want you to know that when you and I worship God, it reminds the enemy that he's defeated in the name of Jesus. And that fragrance, that same fragrance that's pleasing to God is also something of a reminder to hell. And I think we need to remind the enemy often that he's defeated in Jesus' name. And so this, those that were defeated would come, that fragrance would come up, and they would, the people on the side would smell that, and it would define defeat. Now watch this. The same clapping that attributed victory to one, they would actually not clap for, but when those taken in defeat came by, they would clap at them. And they would say, you are defeated. You're defeated. And sometimes there would be a chant. And sometimes they would even hiss. Now, we don't do that anymore. But I need you to know the context of which, by which Paul writes. It's a, it, that same fragrance is one of a reminder of defeat. And they would actually clap. We find that in the book of Job again. As God is talking with Job. And would you read with me Job 27 verse 23. Would you read it with me? Go. Men will clap their hands at him and hiss him from every place. They were talking about those that were sick or defeated because they didn't obey God, whatever their false conclusions were. And then one of them said that they're going to clap their hands at him and hiss him. They're going to attribute that, the fact that you're defeated because look at you. Now, even though the theology still has to be straightened out later, in the culture back then, you could clap as an attribute to victory but you also clap as a reminder of defeat. Do you understand? And so sometimes we need to stand here and applaud God, and other times we need to say to the devil, I defeat you in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord rebuke you. You are defeated. I clap over my family. You are defeated in Jesus' name. You don't get to come near my family. You don't get to come near my children. You don't get to come near this church. You are defeated in Jesus' name. And there is the ripple effect to hell that these people know the power of worship. And you become a people that is very authoritatively powerful for the kingdom of God. You become a, a foe to hell. And hell notices that. And it's time we raise a church and a people who understand the power of worship. Because it's not just singing religious songs. It's doing spiritual warfare. It is protecting our families. It is blessing people. And it honors God so much that he comes and puts his throne right down in the middle. How many of you say amen? We want to be a people of worship. Can you say amen?